Good morning, everyone. So uh, because the previous session ran a little late, we'll just give uh, another one minute for people to join um, if they're um, coming in from that previous session. So I just beg your patience for one more minute. Morning. Hi. Checking if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to session two of the 2021 um, Big Data Forum. Uh, uh, the title of this session is Big Data, Big Business. So it's very clear what today's um, this session will be about. Um, really, it's about unlocking big data's potential for smarter business in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we're joined today by uh, several speakers, and then we'll have a panel discussion. So I'll just introduce our first speaker this morning, um, Dr. Karen, Kevin Flaherty. He's the faculty head of the Arthur Lockjack Global School of Business. Dr. Flaherty lectures on data analytics and artificial intelligence, supply chain and process operations management, and business development and innovation. Prof um, Dr. Flaherty, the floor is yours. Take it away. Hi, good morning all, and thanks, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. I am happy to be here today, and I want to thank the management and staff of UNDP for organizing this much-needed event. Give me a second. Let me share my presentation. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Please say if you are not seeing it, but I hope we're, everyone- We're seeing can. it, it's fine. Okay, lovely. All right, so today we're here to talk about building a big data ecosystem to achieve business objectives. All right, so the agenda today, and I only have 20 minutes, so I'll be as fast as possible um, with these areas so that I can spend some time on content that I would like to discuss. What is big data? Valuing big data as a competitive resource, understanding big data ecosystems and data maturity, strategic alignment and uh, supply chain visibility. So what is big data? Let me just move this, all right. So when we think about big data, what I want you guys to think about, we always had access to data in Trinidad and Tobago, all right? But what differentiates having data in departments, for example, from big data, it's three main characteristics, and that's the volume of data that is available to us, the velocity at which that data is, is being produced, and the variety of data, different forms of data accessible to us. As a result of that, it changes the way we could analyze data. The traditional approach to analyzing data would be one whereby we would have to develop a hypothesis, ask a question, have data specific to answer in that question, whereby big data changes things a bit for us. Now that we have all this data available so, to us, so much data, we could now engage in exploration without having a question or a hypothesis to begin. All right, what we do at this point is we look for correlations within our data set, and by identifying these correlations, we are able to develop insight that we wouldn't have previously developed. In other words, I'm saying we can get answers and develop insights without really having a question to begin our analysis. All right, with big data, we can leverage more data, all right, because we are capturing more data, we can leverage more data, we could find things that we didn't initially conceptualize. With the traditional approach to analyzing data, and this traditional approach would have been post big data. Of course, analytics could be used with, with segmented data, but big data allows us to analyze more data and, and therefore develop more insights, all right? The traditional approach, we would need to carefully cleanse information before analysis. With big data, 
with big data, we don't have the issue of carefully cleansing data, all right? It therefore means, I don't know if any of you would be familiar with the term of garbage in, garbage out. That term is really synonymous with the traditional approach to data analysis, whereby if you begin your analysis with a set of data, a narrow set of data that is specific to your question and your hypothesis, if you analyze that data set you, you, and you actually select the wrong set of data, you could get garbage as your output. But with the world of big data, because there's so much data available to us, it means that we have more flexibility and the ability to develop insights where insights wasn't previously existing. All right? So with big data, all right, because data is being produced every second of every day in different formats, we have to have the ability to capture, store, and analyze this data unlike the traditional approach that was more static in nature, outdated somewhat. So some, so what you can think of is, is a finance department using monthly sales data to develop uh, a forecast of what may happen uh, in the foreseeable future. Sometimes that analysis may be a bit off and that's because the data was somewhat static. Big data, on the other hand, it's continually being generated. And therefore, if we can develop the ability to analyze this current data, we would be in a better position to understand our environment and make decisions that would help us to gain and achieve our objectives. All right? So I hope you guys were able to understand that concept of big data very quickly. So in today's presentation, when we talk about creating value out of data and, and using that value to make a competitive resource, I will be focusing mainly on investment into data ecosystem and data maturity and business outcomes. Of course, when we talk about data analytics, big data, there are some other important concepts that we need to pay attention to, and that is data governance. All right, what is the quality of your data? Is your data reliable? Are there regulation bodies in place to ensure that your data is being maintained to a specific standard? And decentralization of data analytics. I want everyone to understand that to build a data analytics ecosystem, everyone has to be involved, not just the people in the data world, not just the programmers and the people who do statistics and analytics, but everyone needs to partake in building a data analytics ecosystem. And let me explain why. So let's use this analogy of understanding what an ecosystem is. My friend here will help me to explain. So if we want this plant, this sunflower, to look as beautiful as possible, it needs certain nourishment. It needs oxygen. It, it produces oxygen as an output, but it needs carbon dioxide. It needs water. It needs light for photosynthesis, all right? Each one of these aspects has a contribution towards creating the output that we want, which is a beautiful looking sunflower and oxygen as, as a byproduct of the photosynthesis process. Similarly, a data analytics ecosystem has that same concept, whereby there are different layers within this ecosystem. I want you to look at the center and we are moving on an outward direction, all right? At the center, you would have data superstructure or the foundation and technical support. Think of that as the core of, of your ecosystem. Here is where you're gonna find technical people that support the data which we have captured from the wider society. At level two, think of that as the data superstructure. At level two, are the people that will use the data that we have captured from the wider society. And of course, that therefore means that level three are the sources of where we would capture data from, all right? It therefore means that the synthesis and collaboration of these, of these three layers are very important and key to developing the type of ecosystem that we would like. 
All right. Look at this diagram for a second. So what this diagram is trying to communicate is the idea that if any aspect within the three layers that I just described is not operating as it ought to, then we would find a situation of suboptimal decision making. Remember that the interaction of these layers help produce and help in the first instance capture data, ensure that quality and governance of that data is maintained and create outputs for evidence-based decision making. If these layers are not working how they ought to, we would produce suboptimal decisions that won't help us to be both efficient and effective in our business endeavors. So for example, if we have in the core, and, and, and I refer to the core as data substructure or the foundation of the ecosystem, if we have in the core outdated technology that does not effectively support business transactions in the core, well then it doesn't matter how much um, sources of data we have available to us in the external environment, we will not have the necessary foundation in place to capture and store that data. If for, if for example, if for example, we don't have business users who can understand, read and present and communicate data, then we would be in a situation whereby they cannot they cannot use that data effectively to make the type of decisions that create that can create the, the level of productivity that we want from within our organization. Regulators, on the other hand, we need regulators in the ecosystem. Why? If you think about, for example, uh, the energy sector or the finance sector, you would come to find that the energy sector and the finance sector, as far as data and analysis is concerned, is more advanced than other sectors within the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. This is because these sectors have to deliver um, reports on an on a annual basis, for example, and in producing and meeting those standards, it means they have to maintain certain protocols within the organization to ensure that they are meeting these standards. If we are void of such standards in the world of our data analytics ecosystem, then companies would be a bit relaxed, if you will, in creating the necessary standards that are necessary to, to deliver on the ecosystem development that we would like to see in Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm saying that companies, if at any point within your, within your core level two or level three, you have challenges, you have pain points, this would be an area for you to start improving on in order to develop your specific competencies within your ecosystem. And remember, the company ecosystem, a collection of company ecosystem is a reflection of your economy or your societal ecosystems as a whole. So if within individual companies, we have suboptimal ecosystems resulting in suboptimal decisions, then as a society or economy, we would be able to deliver on the level of performance, productivity, transparency that we would like to have. So Trinidad and Tobago, what is data maturity? When I say data maturity, I want you to understand that in order, sorry, that in order for data to be mature, it needs certain aspects for it to be mature. Those aspects would be the employers need to have leadership, systems and processes in place to ensure that data matures in a certain way. Talent, where the employees are concerned, they need to be champions of change. They need to understand how to use data, speak data. They, they need to understand how to use the technology that helps us to communicate and store data. Consumers need to demand and provide data. Suppliers need to demand, provide data and enforce standards when communicating data. And of course, government needs to create policy standards and facilitation and support. Let's talk about some real world conversations of data. And many of you may be familiar with some of these conversations. All right. We at Atalog Jack did a study in 2017. And we, from that study, we were able to identify um, 
societies, it's within our societies, how sectors are ranked with the use of data. So if you take a look to, to, to the right of the, the, the presentation, you would see that the automotive sector uses a lot of analytics and data. The banking and insurance, followed by banking and insurance, energy, food, and then wholesale and retail. This gives us an indication where the ecosystems of these specific sectors are. Remember, all ecosystems within our economy needs to develop. But this ranking helps us to identify where the ecosystems are for the specific sector in, as at 2017. So the only time we know our audience is when we do grocery promotions. The data helps us to make better decisions. And they are ranked four out of five. So they are ranked pretty low in, 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 in the table to your right. We have a number of reports available on price and production rank third, all right? So what I want you guys to think about when I'm reading this is the idea of the ecosystem and the component parts of the ecosystem. Why energy sector is ranked third? It's because of the regulation. Banking and insurance rank second. It's because of the regulation and the need to create products and services to meet international standards. So all records in, are in files stored in cabinet drawers and do not know where, I do not know where to begin. This wasn't included in the, in the survey, but I, 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 I placed it in there because it's a common um, theme that we would hear when we are interacting with services within Trinidad and Tobago. We have departmental data, but cannot access key data from, all right? This, 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 sign, this signals the idea that data is isolated uh, within, your, within your organization. Currently developing new client services from online customer insight, rank at number one. So what this slide tells you is, Based on the level of the rank of the sector, it implies the degree or the maturity of the ecosystem. And once the maturity of the ecosystem is significant, it tells us that that sector could be active in regards to their ability to generate, ability to generate profits, ability to be productive. And we can think of each sector listed here and Given our understanding of, how, of our economy, we know how active these sectors are. And I am saying the ability of these sectors to perform is directly, is directly linked to, the, to its relationship to data. So let's talk about the strategic alignment of data. All right. An important point to understand when we talk about big data, when we talk about technology, when we talk about creating a digital economy, is everyone focuses on the concept of automation. Automation is an important ingredient in creating such a society, but it must, it must take into consideration other factors. And now I'm presenting these other factors. We have the social subsystem and we have the external subsystem. What this is basically saying is that we must focus on transforming our organizations in such a way that we can embrace that digital economy because we are creating a big data ecosystem that would allow us to get the type of outcomes that we want from our society. Those outcomes are not only dependent on automating processes, but it is also dependent on creating talent, leadership, and culture. It is dependent on creating standards. It is dependent on governance, systems, processes. All of these must be aligned to create optimization between our systems. And once we create this type of optimization, only then can we begin to realize the benefits of a big data ecosystem. So, now that we've discussed that, I just want to talk briefly about what is possible if and when we create a developed 
ecosystem, we would be able to, to, to benefit from, from concepts like supply chain visibility. We are currently in a pandemic and the companies that are most successful in the pandemic are the companies that are able to have visibility along their supply chain. This visibility is, is, is a result of having relationships and technology in place to allow sharing of data among all stakeholders within your supply chain. Therefore, it requires you as a partner within a supply chain to maintain certain standards and protocols and share that data with other persons along your supply chain. If and when, as a society, we are not putting these measures in place to actively participate in, 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 in changes that are happening around the world, like managing a supply chain using data, then we will actually be omitting ourselves from some of the changes that are happening around the world. As I said, the companies that are being successful in this time of change are the companies that are focused on the use of data for evidence-based decision-making. So what does this mean? Supply chain visibility in a world of COVID-19, the most competitive companies today invest in sharing and mining data along the supply chain. It requires stakeholder along the supply chain to collaborate and maintain shared objectives during value creation to ensure that data products and services are delivered on time, cost and quality. This therefore means that we cannot expect, we can expect export markets to demand data for our goods and services, as well as we should seek data from our imports as a means to satisfy customer expectations and develop big data ecosystem. Saying all of that, we need to understand that the world is moving fast ahead with the use of technology and data in its everyday business, all right? This diagram seeks to highlight where the world is. The world is currently, and when I say world, I mean developed world. It's currently focused on what we commonly know as the fourth industrial revolution. We are, in the third industrial revolution. We are focusing on building competencies and developing efficiencies when it comes to knowledge-based economy type development. But understand this, this is a necessary ingredient in order to stay in the conversation, in order to be competitive and develop sustainable companies. And once we successfully achieve that, we would be in a position to build competencies that are synonymous with the fourth industrial revolution. So that is my presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. And remember the challenge for government, business and society is to find ways of thinking and acting as our world is disrupted by technology and innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flaherty, so much for that presentation. Uh, we will get to the questions when everybody has a chance to um, present and the panelists have an opportunity to um, give their input. So the, the questions and answers will come more towards the last quarter of the event. So I'll move into the next presentation which is from the Mona School of Business and Management. And it's uh, the title of this presentation, uh, Are Your Business Models Ready for the Fourth Industrial Revolution? Um, it deals with the case of Trinidad and Tobago's businesses. Um, the presentation is going to be given by a team led by Dr. Maurice McNaughton, who is the director of the Center for IT Enabled Innovation at Mona School. Um, he'll be joined by Dr. Leela Rao Graham, um, who is an exec deputy executive director at the school, and Dr. Susanna Russell, who is a senior lecturer at the school. Dr. McNaughton and your team, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to join you for this 2021 edition of the, the Big Data Forum. Uh, let me start, well, first of all, I'll introduce my colleagues. Uh, uh, I'm Maurice McNaughton, as Mark said, I'm from the Mona School of Business and Management. My co-conspirators on uh, this presentation and indeed a set of research, uh, quite active research agenda around this topic, um, 
Dr. Susanna Russell and Lila Rao Graham uh, are joining me this morning. Uh, morning, guys. Um, so as I say, it's a real pleasure to be able to join for this uh, edition of the Big Data Forum, uh, Mark. And I want to start by, by thanking the, the UN for inviting us to participate. We had the privilege of doing so in the inaugural edition um, last year. And, and, and real congratulations to, to you on staging what appears to be another excellent forum. So let me just go ahead and share my slides. I have a few that we'll be using to support the uh, conversation. Um, so in the session, we'll be really focusing on just sharing some insights from a recently conducted survey of the business community in Trinidad and Tobago. It was quite interesting just listening to Dr. Fleury talk about the importance of thinking ecosystem and, and sort of framing a little bit of narrative around what the uh, big data, or in fact, more broadly speaking, the data ecosystem, how it is evolving in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so this presentation really is a, uh, that, that's, that's results from a survey that we conducted quite recently and will really help us explore the question of readiness, readiness for big data. What are the, what's the awareness? What are the attitudes and what are the perceived value opportunities, uh, especially among senior executives? Um, because that, that, that's quite important that we get that perspective from that vantage point. Um, you know, and I think this is something I've spoken about uh, previously. We've, we've, we've always been seized on the importance of the role that the private sector should play in this uh, so-called national data ecosystem. Um, and, and previously, when we sort of thought about this from the perspective of open data, um, there was a lot of emphasis on the role that the government plays in opening up and making data available as an important part of that national data infrastructure. And we sort of saw the private sector as active consumers, active consumers um, of data, of course, to drive their own value opportunities for innovation, productivity, et cetera. Um, but you know, more recently, as the global data ecosystem has evolved, um, and the variety of data has uh, gone beyond just open data. We're now speaking in terms of big data, open data, um, internet of things, uh, data arising as a result of the massive scale of digital transformation and digitization that is taking place. Um, as that ecosystem has evolved, um, the role of the private sector has and has to evolve as well. And in fact, we know like to think of the private sector as, um, you know, uh, more both consumers and active producers of data. And uh, since the 2015 SDG agenda, the critical role that private sectors play in enabling a country to capture the full economic and social value of both public and private data has become even more pronounced. Uh, and, and, and as I said, the weight of that role rests both on the consumption side and the production side of the data value chain. Uh, in fact, the most recent uh, World Development Report uh, published just earlier this year, titled Data for Better Lives, uh, suggests that one of the key enablers of integrating the private sector into a sustainable and value-creating um, data ecosystem is, in fact, digital literacy. And that's one of the things that we want to talk about um, today. So, the survey that we did, we think is quite important. Very often in this global sort of dialogue, we tend to use the term private sector in a, in a homogenous way um, and, and just think of the private sector as one sort of block of uh, entities. Um, for all economies, the private sector is actually quite heterogeneous. And uh, it's important that we understand the thinking across sectors across companies, large and small, and hence the importance of this kind of study and, and this kind of survey um, to engage with the community itself and with the um, key stakeholders within that community. Um, so that, that's a framing of, of our presentation. And I'm going to turn over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Susanna Russell, um, to just take us through uh, what we found from this study 
Um, and then subsequent to that, we'll talk about uh, what are the implications of that? What are the insights? What are the key recommendations that we want to leave to you? So Susanna, I'm going to turn over to you um, to take you through what we found down in Trinidad and Tobago. Thanks, Maurice. Go ahead with the slide. So for this survey, we sought to understand the level of awareness of big data among companies in Trinidad and Tobago. We also wanted to identify the various sources of big data that these companies are using and to look at the, ex um, examine the internal capabilities of these companies to exploit big data for value creation. And also we wanted to look at the attitudes of these companies towards sharing their data. So it is a replica of a study that we did last year um, we conducted this study last year among the Jamaican business community. And so this year we worked in collaboration with the UN, Trinidad and Tobago, and we use what we call convenient sampling, meaning companies were solicited from the contacts of UN, Trinidad and Tobago. And 36 companies completed the survey online. So it was run from October the 1st to November the 15th, so just a little bit um, two weeks ago. And 35 of the 36 companies that completed the survey were private companies. So only one company was a government entity. And 85% of these companies were what we classified as SMEs. So they had fewer than 500 employees. The good thing about the survey was that most of the respondents were CEOs or general managers. 80% um, of the persons who completed the survey actually occupied senior level positions in their company. Next, Maurice. So one of the things we wanted to find out was the level of awareness of big data. And so we asked on the survey, you know, their level of awareness, 75% of the persons claimed some awareness, 25% were unsure of what big data meant. And of course, here are just a snippet of some of the responses, clearly of the 75 who claimed some awareness. Um, Dr. Fleury did mention the three Vs um, associated with big data, and most of the participants seem to identify at least two of the three Vs, um, high volume data, and high variety data. Um, one respondent who was unsure, cheekily mentioned the fact that we should have defined what big data was. And so they would have been able to answer the question which would have defeated the purpose of the survey anyway, because we wanted to get a sense of you know, their awareness of big data. Next slide, Maurice. So we asked about their experience with big data and only about 8% of these respondents claim to be effectively using big data, which means 92% claim to have no experience, they're beginners in the use of big data, or they're just planning to use big data. So even though there was a high level of awareness of big data, these companies were not effectively using big data. Next. We inquired about big data strategy within these companies. 61% had no big data strategy. 19% claimed to have a strategy. But then if you put this with the previous question, even though 19% claim to have a big data strategy, they still consider themselves beginners in the use of big data. Because remember, 92% claimed to be beginners in the use of big data. So while it appears that some strategy exists in some companies, these private companies appear to not be effectively using big data. Next. We wanted to get a sense of the data sources from which companies were actually collecting data. And so we asked them about sources that they were now collecting data from and sources that they expect to collect data, um, data in the next one to three years. 
Not surprisingly, 80% of the respondents are collecting transactions data, such as sales, financial, and customer service data. Now, this is a type of data that would be considered a byproduct of their day-to-day -day activities. And therefore, it kind of explains the prevalence. Um, not much interest has been indicated towards collecting more data from sources like earth observation, sensors, um, radio frequency identification, geospatial data, and these are more real-time data sources. So from a technical point of view, we believe that companies should make an effort to collect um, these real-time data that will enable them to make better decisions and data-driven decisions and make them much quicker. Next. Now, one of the things, the factors that um, contributes to the success of big data and big data initiatives, well, the success or the failure, has to do with senior management's commitment. And when we asked this question on the survey, about half of the respondents believed that senior management was committed to big data initiatives. 50% um, were said no, or they were a little bit uncertain of their commitment. I found this particularly interesting because 25% said they were unsure of seniors management commitment. Now bear in mind that 80% of the persons who completed the survey actually occupied senior positions in their organizations. Yes? So we also asked about um, untapped value opportunities with big data. So we wanted to find out if there were data that organizations consider to be of potential business value, but they are not yet able to exploit that data. And less than half the organizations, as a matter of fact, 39% believe that there is valuable data that is currently not being exploited by their organizations. 47% were unsure whether there was valuable data to be exploited. Now, again, remember most of the respondents were senior managers. And so it's a little bit interesting that they were unsure, although we could probably explain um, probably some of the reasons for this response. We also asked them to identify how much of the data was being used to generate value for the company. And only about 6% of the companies indicated that they were using more than 90% of the data they actually collect to generate value for their company. Next. We wanted to find out about the barriers um, that these organizations face in maximizing big data's value. And some of the presenters would have already spoken about some of these barriers. And it is the same barriers that you would find in the literature. So it's not unique to Trinidad and Tobago. As a matter of fact, we found the same set of barriers when we ran the survey among Jamaican companies. So lack of skills or expertise, the cost of the infrastructure, um, the complexity of the data, just senior management's commitment, leadership buy-in, and the culture of the organization. And of course, the, I think I mentioned the complexity of the data, the perceived risk of little return on investment once the company invests in the infrastructure to actually get the data. Next. We were interested also with um, about the data sharing practices of these companies. So we asked organizations who share their data with external partners, the reason that they actually share this data. And some of the reasons given were to satisfy regulatory requirements and statutory obligations, to create opportunities to generate business, um, to build stakeholder relations, and just to collaborate with colleagues. And we also probed a little bit further to find out about the perceived added value that these companies believe they're getting from sharing their data. And some of the answers included increased revenues, in improved customer experience, of course, which will lead to customer loyalty and better customer retention, improved customer satisfaction and relationships, and just improved business partnerships. Now, 30% of the participants 
do not currently share their data. And some of the reasons given were, you know, nobody ever asked them to share the data. They weren't too sure, you know, if their data was actually useful. And the minister in the earlier session spoke about confidentiality and privacy concerns. So these companies clearly have the same set of um, concerns. Next. We wanted, it, this is not, the survey is not an end in itself. We want to see how these private companies can collaborate with academia and what services and support they may require from us so we can collaborate. And the three main services that they require or they would like to partner with us on is some executive training, some capacity building workshops, and some customized data analytics. So probably if we can go in and help them to do some data analytics. Um, Lila will speak some more on that. Yes. So as I said before, this is just a replica of the study that we did for Jamaica. And the sample size for both countries are fairly the same. We had 40 respondents for the Jamaican survey, 36 mainly private companies. The demographics were slightly different for the Jamaican sample. About 43% were large companies. And what we mean by large, they employed more than 500 um, employees. In Trinidad, we had primarily small companies. Now, even though the demographics were pretty dissimilar, Trinidad is an industrialized country, far more industrialized than Jamaica. So a lot of the responses came from um, oil and gas, petrochemical, telecoms, utilities. Whereas for the Jamaican survey, a lot of the responses came from services. However, the, there were more similarities than differences in the results. So it's safe to say that private companies across the region, I mean, the region meaning the two companies that we have looked at, um, whether it's um, large companies, whether they're SMEs, they seem to be sitting on this vast amount of data, but they're simply not maximizing the benefits of the data. Um, the executives remember that more than 80% of the persons who completed the survey were senior management for both um, countries. They recognize the value potential, but the organizations lack the capabilities to exploit these value potentials. So clearly there are some opportunities for a regional approach, which Lila may talk a little bit more about. Handing it over to Lila. Okay, thank you, Susanna. And just to follow up from there, I think the good news that comes out of the survey is that although there are these untapped data value opportunities and a number of bar uh, barriers, we found that the senior management really is conveying that they are receptive to opportunities, engagement, and dialogue around big data. We plan to share the details of this survey very shortly, but we want to highlight three recommendations. Maurice? Our first recommendation is that the business community look at building their internal capacity as it relates to big data. And again, this was identified as a barrier from the study. And I think earlier presenters have also focused on this. We think that this is something that can be addressed through collaboration with academia in the form of customized training and senior management workshops, for example. The second recommendation uh, we make is to really demonstrate rather than just talk about the opportunities for big data. Actually seeing what is possible is one of the surest ways to get buy-in and commitment. This can be done through the development of proof of concepts, which are quick, low cost big data solutions that demonstrate the value of the data to organizations. The POCs or proof of concepts approach will help identify the value opportunities and sway those who are unsure of the potential of the data. This is critical for senior management buy-in. The final recommendation is around the establishment of public-private partnerships, and really to just build an awareness of the importance and benefits of building these partnerships. Maurice?
we have to emphasize, and again, I'm happy to hear that, that this was mentioned in this morning's opening session, the importance of systematic capacity building as part of the big data agenda. We need to build awareness and change the mindset of the community at all levels. We need to treat data as a critical asset it is. And the fact that the study has shown that many companies did not have a big data strategy or were not sure they had one is a signal that this may not be a priority for many. This change in mindset needs to come from the top as a critical success factor for big data initiatives is senior management buy-in. This building of awareness and culture change can be supported through conducting executive seminars. The survey also suggests that we need to build the specialized skills and expertise. And again, this is something that has been talked about since this morning for analytics and big data. Again, this capacity can be developed through higher education program and hands-on technical workshops. But the one we want to speak a little bit about is what we feel the importance of capacity building related to our, our region. And this is a more broad-based data literacy capacity development. And again, I'm, I, it was a question that was brought up this morning about the ways that we can build citizens into this skill set. We need to embed this data literacy training at all stages of education. We know there's some initiatives on the way because Maurice is, is involved in some of those initiatives. So Maurice, I'll leave it to you to just update everyone about these initiatives in the region. Yeah, thank you, Lila. Um, and thank you, Susanna, for taking us through, again, what I think is a quite important uh, ongoing study because, uh, you know, very often we're making assumptions or the narrative is making assumptions about the private sector and the capabilities of the private sector and the resources that the private sector has um, without necessarily truly engaging and understanding those. So I think it's an important study. Um, Lila, you're right. I mean, the, 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 you know, a lot of the times the discussions on things like big data and big data analytics puts a lot of emphasis on the data science uh, component of it, puts a lot of emphasis on artificial intelligence and machine learning and the kind of sophisticated algorithms that are really quite important uh, opportunities, but, but very often we miss, uh, miss what I think is perhaps at this point in our evolution, perhaps the most important thing that we can do and is to build digital and data capacity, broadly speaking, um, as a whole of society approach. Um, you know, and, and the private sector, for instance, may perhaps say, well, why is this is important to us? I mean, we really want to uh, develop and engage the data scientists. Uh, so let me just share a little bit of perspective on that because we've been doing some work in that uh, area with the private sector here in Jamaica. Uh, let's see what's happening. Right. And, and so why should this matter to the private sector? Well, if you think about it, and I, I mean, COVID has amplified the urgency of this, but if you think about it, uh, the emergence of the digital economy means that the entire work landscape is changing. Um, digital literacy and data skills, and I speak about those in combination, are really essential in-demand employability skills. I mean, this is something that has to happen at every level of employee, not just the specialists. Um, your consumers are becoming more digitally savvy. And so their demand for digital products and services is increasing. So uh, nowadays consumers tend to benchmark their expectation of a digital customer experience based on what they experience when they use the Facebooks and the other social media platforms. So we have to be creating our online customer experiences with that in mind. Um, the idea of assessment is a critical aspect of this. Um, understanding where employees' capabilities are to be able to inform digital upskilling programs. And having standardized tools to do that is important. One of the things that we've found in the work we're doing here is just a lot of fragmentation. A lot of companies are sort of doing their own thing. And the importance of having national open uh, 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 educational resources for these kinds of initiatives is quite important. 
And ultimately, what we have to do in our economies, if we're going to be competitive, is to um, build digitally, digitally literate, not only workforce, but the labor market writ large. I just want to mention a couple of initiatives that we're doing here in Jamaica that, again, underscore the importance of this whole of society approach to this. Uh, governments, uh, regulatory agencies, um, the private sector, the educational sectors. And so one of the things that we're doing here, um, sorry, my other slides uh, acting up a little bit. But yeah, I just wanted to share with you, one of the things that we're doing here is uh, developing a, uh, a unified um, sort of national framework for uh, digital literacy. Um, this is a framework that would provide for um, not only a standardized competency framework, which I'm just displaying here on the screen, um, but also a set of standardized assessment tools and, and measures that would allow us to take a country approach to this. And I, I think, Mark, what this helps us to underscore is the importance of these uh, collective approaches, not only at the national level, but also at the regional level. And so that's a quite important project that at the business school we're doing in collaboration with the regulators, the Broadcast Commission of, of Jamaica. So I uh, just wanted to make that particular point and the importance of this sort of whole of society approach to um, digital and data capacity building. Um, and Lila, I mean, that engagement gives us some other opportunities. And let me turn back over you for, to you to just sort of yeah. wrap up on these. I think what becomes important to recognize is that we, as we engage around capacity building, there are other opportunities for collaboration that will more, emerge in a more organic way. These include the sharing of data, sharing of infrastructure, and really collaboration and sharing of expertise. The business community really are holding key data assets that can contribute to official statistics and can be used as sustainable development goals proxies. For example, if we think about the mobile phone data, we can use it to map the movement of mobile phone users to predict the spread of disease. Very important in, in, in our context. We can also use that same mobile phone data to look at spending patterns on mobile phone services. And these can provide proxy indicators of income level. The second opportunity is related to the infrastructure that the business community has invested in. This can be used to support advanced big data analytics on public sector data. And finally, there's opportunities to leverage data science expertise in academia across the business community, both private and public sector. Again, this has been recognized as one of the barriers so we can use training and workshops and support data-driven in innovation in key sectors such as tourism, agriculture, and education, which were mentioned by the minister this morning. Yeah. Maurice? So, I, I mean, you yeah. know, so it's not just big data, it's a big opportunity, but it's a big opportunity that requires all hands on deck. Um, the private sector has to recognize the role that they play. I think private sector leadership executive leadership at a strategic level is absolutely critical. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the urgency of digital transformation for many organizations. Um, well, big data and big data analytics is one of the core pillars of digital transformation. So that, you know, and again, I'm very happy that we had so much um, senior management participation in surveys like this. And that's the level at which the engagement needs to take place. This is not just a technology play to relegate to the um, the IT organizations, as important and critical as your role is. Um, and so just want to leave us on this particular note that this is an imperative for uh, the executive leadership of our organizations. So Mark, uh, those are our thoughts. And as we well, said, the, you, present, yeah. the, the, the report will be ready shortly to share with the community. But thank you, um, Dr. McNaughton, for that great presentation. And thank you, Dr. Flaherty, from before. So we heard from academia giving their perspective on the private sector and business community. I want to now get a key member of the business community here in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Mr. Nira Tiwari, who is the uh, CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce of Trinidad and Tobago, to now give the perspective of the private sector. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Flaherty spoke about uh, Trinidad and Tobago's private sector going from like the third industrial revolution to the fourth industrial revolution. 
um, Dr. McNaughton and his team talked about how, although like many of the business community are aware of the big data and, and, and to some extent big data's use to the private sector, a, a much smaller percentage are actually v viewing it as useful and applying it. So I would like to get your perspectives of where those discrepancies can come from. Sure. So um, thanks very much, Mark, to you and the team at the UN for having us participate and to all of the presenters. I, I thought those were very, very useful presentations, um, the context and then the, the actual data. So in 2018, um, Cham Trinidad and Tobago actually embarked on our digital transformation advocacy in a, in a louder way. And we, we established a digital transformation committee and every year since we've been hosting a, a technology conference called this Tech Hub Island Summit um, to advance the, the digital transformation agenda in both the public and private sectors. And, and so, yes, I think, I, I mean, the data seems to reflect what we're seeing, which is that many companies understand that there's a digital transformation imperative. It's not, it's not specific to, um, to data analytics or, or the usage of big data, but I think we all appreciate that understanding better your customer segments, where your business opportunities and pain points are, uh, will be key to improving efficiency and growing the business. So whatever we do in terms of digital transformation will have to be underpinned by data. And that is true in providing government services as well. So companies by and large are at that point where they are trying to, I, I think the feedback we get is that they are still at the stage where they are trying to determine what questions they want answered. And I know Dr. Flurry said that, you know, big data would help us answer some of those questions without having to ask them and that's true um, but that's for bigger companies in the main and so smaller companies still don't I think I think we haven't connected in terms of the ecosystem we haven't yet connected the companies or the people like uh, Dr. Hussein and his Professor Hussein and his group at, at TT Labs we haven't effectively connected the people who can solve, diagnose and solve problems with the people who have problems to be solved. And then when you identify the issues that you want to address, ensuring that you have the tools and the talent to do so. So we are at an early stage, but what I expect and what I'm seeing is that once we, once we really get on that train, our train is going to be a bullet train. It will move very, very fast. The private sector in Trinidad and Tobago is very agile, but I'm not sure how quickly, how, how much track we'll have to run on given the, the pace of digital transformation in the, in the public sector and how we bridge to ensure that if we can in fact move quickly as a private sector, we are able to move along with the government so that we're not um, we're not smaller, we're not slowed, sorry, um, or we're not moving more slowly than we can go. So I'll leave it there for now, I think. Uh, in fact, I sort of have a follow-up question for you, Nirad. So you, you speak of the, the private sector, and to some extent, uh, Dr. McNaughton's data suggested that the private sector are sort of raring to go, and it's now a matter of like this enabling environment for these things to happen and uh, that includes academia and government. But from the private sector then, what are the shortcomings from those two other sectors, um, what they could possibly be? And how would you like to see things align? Yeah, going so, so I actually interpreted it a little differently. I, I thought um, uh, Dr. McNaughton and his team were sort of throwing down the gauntlet at the private sector in a good way, saying that, Look, I mean, you guys have to move from understanding that digital transformation, big data um, is, is, is important to actually doing something about it. And I, and, and I, think, I think that's fair. I think, 
um, understanding that one, we need to move faster as a private sector around digital transformation, um, not just conceptually, but but actively, I think is 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 fair. And I think saying that there, there are things that the private sector can do or ways in which the private sector can contribute to the digital transformation ecosystem. And again, I'm saying big data is part of it and providing the data is part of it, but it's not the be all and end all. I think we in the private sector have to see what are the things, do a better job of seeing what are the things that we can do without needing anyone else. Um, and, and that to me starts with proper diagnostics, right? How are we diagnosing our challenges so that we can go to the, to the academics, to the UE. So I'm um, Trinidad and Tobago, for example, next year, one of our key objectives is to develop training programs. Now, um, you know, ideally this would be done in partnership, not necessarily with a traditional academic institution, because what we're doing is not, is not a, a diploma and below, right? So, so that the traditional academic institutions will have even more of a feedstock as it were, if, if we are successful in, in doing what we're doing, but companies will get people trained to solve their problems today or within you know, six weeks to three months. And, and so, so that's how, for example, we are trying to solve some of the, the challenges. With regards to governments, I think, I think you know, fundamentally, I, I think government needs to stop pause and try to do things the simplest way rather than the most difficult way. It often feels like there are things that can be done quite simply that governments overcomplicate, right? Call it bureaucracy or call it fair. Um, the, there, there's a lot that can already happen given the legislative structure and what exists, uh, but governments need to uh, and our government needs to to try and understand what is the you know what is the customer interface so for example just before i came on this webinar i was speaking to someone senior from our water authority and we have a huge problem with wasted water here because of of, of leaks right the, the 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 pipe system is is very very old and so it springs leaks all the time and the person was telling me, you know, you know, we have a very robust and, and complex infrastructure to manage that. I said, yes, but if I want to report a leak, why don't you just have a WhatsApp number that I can take a picture of the leak and send your location? And then you deal with the, the backend infrastructure because the customer, what you want is the information coming in. And so governments tend to, I think, make it a little harder than it needs to be. So even things around uh, electronic payments and so on. We had a webinar last week and, 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 and the legal people are telling us that it's, it, it need not be as complex as, as it is because the legal infrastructure already is there to accept uh, e-signatures and, and payments in the government sector and the like. But that doesn't mean that the government is accepting them, right? Or the government departments are accepting them. And so they overcomplicate what should be um, simply, you know, uh, Mr. Young, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it, it could be even simpler than, a, than, a, than an app is the point I'm making because the app requires me to first download the app. I'm saying everyone has WhatsApp and we can send it, but that's just an example that we can make things much simpler if we think of what is the purpose, what, 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 what is the what are we trying to do and, and who feels the pain at what point, you know, and, and that's, that's what I think should be done. So the private sector has to do more. We have to understand where we can contribute without needing anybody's support. We have to define the things that we need so that we can ask specifically. The, the, the academics hopefully will be even more proactive and responsive and engage with us. Um, and I think that they have, I mean, I think Professor Hussein is doing a lot at the labs. I, I know, you know, Dr. Malou at, 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 at the um, at computer science, they're trying. And then, you know, working with the government and, and I think that the, um, I think that the, the, the uh, you know, there are some government agencies like the TTIFC who are really trying to work in a very proactive manner with the private sector. And I think that those things can, 
can go a long way if all done together. Thanks, Narad. So uh, I know Dr. McNaughton, you had mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the sort of like, uh, <laughs> it sort of like inflamed the process that you, you know, like we, we were like on a path to achieve these things within a particular period of time. And the pandemic came along and forced us to accelerate. And I think we can see it like with, with education here in Trinidad and Tobago that we were to some extent unprepared for this, this new paradigm shift towards digital, digital, a digital education system. Um, with regards to like the business community now and that things have sort of like this pace of change has accelerated because of the pandemic. Uh, where do you see like the Trinidad, um, the challenges and the opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago private sector? Yeah, um, so just to touch on something that, that Nirad say and, and, and Nirad greetings. I think the last time we engaged was um, maybe a few years ago at a workshop put on by the uh, the Court of UK, I forget. The, the Supreme and the and and, and well, indeed, Martin. indeed, indeed. Um, well, let me just say, and I, I tell the point that you you said, for instance, maybe academia and the government doesn't move fast enough, and the private sector needs to do it on their own. I, I, I would suggest that academia and 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 we are in fact becoming a little bit more agile, and while a lot of our traditional academic and quality systems are a little bit slower moving because that's the nature of the beast. Um, there's quite a bit of work that we're doing today, um, working with industry to develop more responsive um, digital upskilling programs, competency-based training, micro-credentialing, right? So that people don't have to go to a three-year program to do a degree. They can you know, spend six weeks and do a particular specific um, competency training. I think that kind of collaboration is important because it's really, it's all hands on deck. And one of the challenges I've seen in, in our jurisdiction is a little bit of fragmentation in terms of each company wanting to do their own thing rather than coming together with academia. And in our case, we're working with the regulators, the Broadcasting Commission to put together this sort of national approach um, to digital media and information literacy skills which um, bundles a variety of things, including the competency frameworks, um, the type of assessment that someone can do to understand where they're starting from and, and, and bundling training courses. I think those collective approaches are important at this stage if we're gonna be able to move at the pace that is required uh, by the onset of the digital economy. Um, but I agree with you, it has to be far more agile than we have, uh, our institutions have done in the past. But I think we're getting there. And it starts with dialogue. It starts with uh, an intent and a willingness to collaborate, which we actually heard coming out of the survey. And that is something, uh, Mark, that we need to just capitalize on in terms of the kinds of engagement that we put in place to work with the business community and the private sector. And I see a, a comment from um, Richard Young. He's sending in comments as we speak. But the, the sort of like mechanism for collaboration and maybe Dr. Flary, uh, this is a point for you to jump in here and uh, the other panelists as well to join, jump in. But uh, Dr. Phil Flary had spoken about this uh, ecosystem that needs to, to be in place for these things to happen. How formalized does that, ha does that have to be? Um, and is, is there a need then for some sort of like formal mechanism to be set in place where these multi-sectoral stakeholders can, can, can regularly and um, collaborate and at the level that's required? I would say, yes, we need some type of formal policy and or approach to developing the ecosystem. Because if you have a situation where the private sector or some companies within the private sector are developing at a fast pace, the public sector is developing at a slow pace, Remember what happens within an ecosystem is if parts of the ecosystem are not operating how it ought to, it affects the entire performance of the ecosystem. So yes, companies that move ahead on developing their organizational ecosystem will of course have and realize benefits. But I think the goal, we need to understand what is the goal, is if the goal is to create um, operational efficiencies within your organization and internal 
and internal uh, productivity in the organization only, then focusing on developing uh, analytics within your organization to help manage those uh, deliverables are good. But if we want to focus on things that will help us internationalize companies, and I think that is where we need to go as a society, we want to internationalize uh, companies and therefore in internationalizing companies, all right, there needs to be a situation whereby they can collaborate and share information. So for example, a company in the private sector that, that may want to internationalize, if they can't access data at a time, set in a time sensitive way from the public sector in regards to port facilities, that would impact their logistics and ability to compete on a global scale. And therefore I am saying, if we want to create the type of companies that can have the competitive advantage that we want, because the success of, of these companies is a direct has a direct implication on the success of us as an economy. So, so, so if we look at the, at the organizational standpoint, yes, companies can be successful. But if we look at it from the standpoint of developing a strong economy that is um, diversified using digital competencies, then we have to find a way to collaborate and grow. It's, there's no problem in having some players stronger than others. Um, in fact, that sets and creates benchmarks internally for us to try and, and reach the other parties. But we need some type of shared agreed um, framework to guide development. And we need to set some timelines to satisfy the persons that would like to achieve specific objectives. Mr. Tuari. Sorry, Professor, you go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, and listen, I, I, I completely agree with, with both sides of this dialogue. Um, we need frameworks because we have to do shared approaches. It's too inefficient for everyone to do their own thing. But those frameworks have to be, and, 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 and Kevin, I like the idea of ecosystems because there's a kind of organic growth to ecosystems, which is not by its nature and definition bureaucratic, as you rightly say, you know, everyone doesn't have to wait for everyone else. So we have to be very careful that we don't stifle the process with um, bureaucracy. Um, but I think shared approaches, shared resources. I mean, there's an emerging discussion around this idea of digital public goods, which is, which is I think, going to take some, uh, become quite visible. Um, I think we have to treat both data and the frameworks and the policies and the tools around them that persons can access as something that is available in the general public domain. Um, and so I think it requires both um, systematic structured frameworks, but also agility um, to ensure that the fast movers can move at their own pace. Mr. Tiwari? Yeah. So um, as, I, as I'm mentioning our digital transformation committee, that's, it, it, that's one attempt to, to do this. So we have on that committee, for example, the TKIFC, as, as I was mentioning earlier, as a member, we have Kariri on that committee. Um, we have the IDB uh, with the new Ministry of Digital Transformation. Uh, when we met with the minister and the PS, you know, we've asked them to, to put someone on the committee. So, so we are trying to do that. And, and, and what I was saying, you see, I, I think I think that's a, a, a bit of a bit of a challenge in the Caribbean is that sometimes, you know, when we when we try to acknowledge where we are, it's seen as as, as aggressive. It's not. Uh, but I think we if 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 we need to if we are saying that we are in the third industrial revolution, when we need to be in the fourth, then we need to acknowledge that some things are not working as they should. It doesn't mean that it's anybody's fault today. It may not even be that it's anybody's, any specific person's fault. It might be our collective inaction in the past. It might be our, uh, and so moving, but we can't fix something that we don't acknowledge needs fixing. And so, you know, we have to not be thin skinned as we as we embark on this process. And And, and that to me has been, a big part of the challenge because you can't have an open dialogue. You can't have an honest dialogue if people 
see your honesty as 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 aggression or an attempt to lay blame when in fact what you're trying to do is identify the the, the problem the pain point and possible solutions so that we can do it i would like to say that we had a fantastic meeting with the minister of digital transformation when he was um when he was appointed um and as a result of that the private sector, Amcham, Trinidad and Tobago and the TNT Chamber came together and we digitized the records or we basically we entered the data for 23, 24,000 extra forms from vaccination that had nothing to do with us. And we had a, 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 a you know, so there are ways that we can help if allowed to and if we have the dialogue. And, be, and it was because the minister said that part of the challenge that they have at the moment with the digital vaccine certificates is that not all the information is entered. So that was a statement of fact that was truthful and we didn't say, well, minister, that's all your fault. We said, well, how can we help? And, and, and you know, and that was, that was a way that we could assist in solving at least part of a problem. And if we, so collaboration only comes through trust, it comes through openness and it comes through willing to listen and speak about things that might start off seeming like difficult things. And as we as we go through that process, we'll find solutions pretty quickly, I think. With that, I have to bring this session to a close. I, I, I think we had a very interesting and, and uh, enthusiastic discussion. So with that, I will uh, bring this session to a close and tease the next session, which starts in a few minutes time. It starts at 12.40 and that session will be on um, uh, the future of pharmacy and the business case of MEDL, which is a company that is using big data and artificial intelligence in the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry. So sorry, thank sorry, you again. Mark. Yes, just yeah. a quick question. Um, I just want to answer a question from Andy. He wanted to find out about the um, survey yeah. and the results. So. He wanted to know how we selected the survey. When we use the contact list from Mark, you were the one who invited your contacts to complete the survey, right? Yeah, so I, I can say that, that um, yes, we have a group of companies that the UN engages with regularly. And also we approach the chambers, including the American Chamber of Commerce, uh, Mr. Tuari was kind to send out the survey to some of his members as well. Uh, the Energy Chamber, the Chamber of Commerce, the Manufacturers Association, the um, hospitality um, in the in industry body as well. So several uh, several bodies were very kind in getting it out to their membership. So that was that. Yeah. So they weren't pre-selected. It just so happened that most of the respondents ended up being SMEs, and they came from a wide variety of industrial sectors um, all over Trinidad and Tobago. The findings: we are publishing a report. The report mark is at the print rate, so you should get the physical copy soon. I'm not too sure how you guys are going to disseminate it. Well, the digital um, copy will be digital on copy. the right, for the Big Data Forum, digital. so it should be um, all members, all, everybody in the public should be able to like get it. Okay, soon. great. Thank you very much. So thank you again. I don't want to great. eat into the next uh, yes. panel time. So thank you so much to everybody for participating and I look forward to seeing you hopefully in future panels. Goodbye.